If you're listening to this podcast, but you thought you'd be watching the video, head over to my YouTube channel, Positive Profit, and look for the thumbnail that says Behind the Treats, Dr. Shannon Alford and Megan Shumper of Clemson University's Ag Service Lab. And that's where you'll find the video. Hey, thanks for joining. This is Kara with Positive Profit. I have a really special episode. This is one I have waited for. For months and you are going to absolutely love it. Today I have with us representatives from Clemson University's Agricultural Service Laboratory. So exciting. I've got Dr. Shannon Alford and Megan Shumpert. Hey Baker, do you want to launch your own dog treat business and make money for your family? Are you discouraged with just giving your dog treats away to friends and family instead of having booming online sales? Do you want to be home more to bake treats and make money selling them online, but you keep telling yourself that you don't know enough healthy dog treat recipes or even have the business or Instagram know-how to make it all happen? Girl, I hear you. In this podcast, you'll find natural dog treat recipes and the secrets to launching your own dog treat business and tips for growing a successful dog treat business. Hi, my name is Kara Brothers, and I learned how to make and sell healthy dog treats that customers want to buy and dogs love. And I started my very own successful dog treat business. Want to know how I did it? Give your dog a treat, grab one for yourself, and let's dig in. Dr. Alford joined Clemson University's Agricultural Service Laboratory as director in 2016, and before that, she was a research staff member in a maize genetics laboratory at Clemson, and prior to coming to Clemson, was an assistant professor at Presbyterian College teaching chemistry and biochemistry while leading undergraduate researchers in plant molecular biology-based projects. She also worked as a professional editor with Edita, providing English language editing of scientific manuscripts. She completed her postdoctoral work and PhD at Virginia Tech in plant pathology, molecular biology, and biochemistry projects. She earned an MS in analytical chemistry from Mississippi State University and a BS in chemistry from Clemson University. At the Clemson Ag Service Lab, she leads three teams of laboratory professionals, one of which provides animal feed testing to clientele. Megan is a chemist for the Clemson University Ag Service Lab. She received her undergraduate de degree from Clemson in food science and nutrition and initially pursued a career in medical lab science. In time, Megan received her MS in health innovation and ultimately redirected her career to chemistry and analytical lab science where she began working with the Ag Service Lab. In this position, she analyzes nutritional and elemental contents in animal feeds and plant tissue. As part of the lab's feed and forage intake, they also test dog treats for nutritional contents required for proper labeling in South Carolina. She finds that it is rewarding to be a part of the Ag Service Lab because she's able to put to work all of her knowledge and experience in food science and laboratory science while providing essential services to the agricultural community. Thank you so much, ladies, for being on the show. Oh. I am absolutely thrilled. There's such a mystery around <laughs> guaranteed analysis, at least on our end as dog treat bakers, as new dog treat bakers, this is a term that most of us in our everyday lives have just never heard of. It just never comes up. But as you begin to want to have a dog treat business, you realize this is something that you're going to need. And we talk about it all the time in our Dog Treat Baker Facebook group. We have well over a, a, a hundred questions in our group by now. So thank you for coming on to explain the process and demystify it for my profiteers. And I'm sure this video will be highly viewed and replayed. It'll also be a great resource in our group for newcomers who are gonna have these exact same questions. So if you could tell me what exactly is a guaranteed analysis and then how is one performed? How do you guys do this? So I'll start out and uh, Megan certainly can fill in as well. But state regulating agencies that regulate food and feed for animals require labels of nutritional content. So to create that label, you need to know what the nutritional content is. And so the guaranteed analysis is actually the lab 
taking your sample, measuring those contents, and creating a report for you to use as your guaranteed analysis. So that's uh, the basics of what it is. And then we can talk a little bit more about the measurements that are involved, but that's the general idea of what a GA is. Great. Perfect. Megan, you want the kind of three main tests that we do for that GA? Yeah, especially with the dog treat testing and the GA, we mainly are looking at fats, fibers, and we do a moisture value. And then also an ADF, which is a, a type of fiber. And, and then protein. And then protein. Yeah. And some states require some different things in that guaranteed analysis. So in, here in South Carolina, those are the three things that we're looking at for our pet treat makers. But you'd have to check with your state regulating agency to know for sure which mm -hmm. tests are required. We know that some of our neighbor states require an ASH content as well. Right. Yeah. So we certainly can this. offer other types of testing, but for our, our state, that's the three main. So. Good to know. Is the ADF that you mentioned, that's acid detergent? Correct. Okay. Okay. Right. Perfect. Yep. I, yep. I have seen that before. Yes. Um, and I see that you have some dog treats on the table. What are those about? We do. So we pulled out some examples of some samples we have received when, in the last, in the last couple, couple, couple days. Probably. Couple days. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is picked up here too significantly. <laughs> um, um, this is looks like bacon. Actually, smells a little it like smells bacon. like <laughs> it might be bacon. Making but... some plates here. Um, Don't need to label. So. Right, yeah. Um, these are some hearts and dog bones. So these are very dry um, samples. This one. Do you remember what's in this? Oh, this is a cheddar biscuit, I think. Cheddar paws. Mm -hmm. Yes, they look like little paws. Yeah. Very cute. Mm -hmm. And then yep. these last ones, we have cookies, basically Oreo cookies here. They've even got frosting on the inside. Oh, how cute. Yes. yes. These other ones, this one is in a bag. Looks a little bit like some jerky. You can see that yeah. as well. Some more biscuits. Secondary cookie. It's basically the same thing. They've just sent two different flavors. So we've got chocolate and vanilla. Yeah. So that's fake chocolate, I'm sure. But fake chocolate. <laughs> this client knew that. Different flavors required a different analysis depending on what the content was. So just a few examples of the types of samples we can analyze here at this lab. Okay. I always have this issue. <laughs> if the dog treats are made really well and they're set out like that, when I'm drinking a cup of coffee, I'm like, oh, that looks good. <laughs> we can definitely get some things that arrive right. and we, we all look in the box and think, hmm. <laughs> I know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So can you tell me about um, what what kind of samples, I see that you've got dry treats there. Can you tell me about proper sampling? Sure. So we want to make, so proper sampling is a big topic, actually. Right. We want to make sure we get the right amount that we can work with, which we'll talk about in a second. We want to make sure that the sample is something we can actually test for. So I mentioned the tests that we were talking about. If it's a type of material we can work with. Hmm. We get some questions about bone material and raw meat and a few other things that we actually don't have the capacity to handle here at this lab. We tell people to ask first before they pay that expensive shipping cost right. to get it to us. As far as sampling properly from a batch, Megan and I were talking earlier about the amount of sample needed. And you want to go over what you need? Yeah, and this is the discussion that we were having. It's not always the easiest um, question to answer because some treats and food items are going to have a lot more moisture than others. So to just say one standard amount, like one cup full, doesn't really apply across the board. So you really got to consider that moisture content. Um, for our lab, particularly, we generally are going with two large treats. So something I would not even actually call these large treats. Would, these would be small treats that we have. So three to four small treats, two larger treats. The customers really just need to keep in mind that moisture, we extract all of the moisture out of it. So it's going to be the final product that we're working with. So we have to have enough of that to do all of our testing as well as um, any follow-up that the customer might request after the fact. And you mentioned, oh. you noticed that these are all dry treats. Those tend to not go bad <laughs> after a while when we have them in the lab. 
Uh, we did not pull out any of the more wet type material. So we do get some of the frozen ice, ice cream, cream yeah. yogurt samples. Yes. Uh, we get some cake sometimes, and that's definitely a higher moisture content. And those types of samples we can work with. We would prefer that they get here very quickly so right. that they haven't gone bad before we start our analysis. Otherwise, we're going to have to ask for more sample to arrive. So we need to make sure those arrive with a cold pack or they've been shipped with expedited shipping, that sort of thing, if they have a higher moisture content and more of a chance for them to actually go bad in transit before we even get our hands on it. That is great that you address that because as dog treat bakers, a lot of us like to make the crunchy treats, but a lot of us like the pastry case items that are the cakey type with the, the icing and the frosting, and they tend to be more moist. So if I'm hearing you correctly, moisture content might play a role in how much of the sample they need to submit dry versus wet. Does that have any bearing on the moisture content? Correct. Yes, it definitely does. So Megan mentioned that we actually dry all of the samples when we receive them. I think you mentioned that. And then we do a moisture content and that involves drying. So the more moisture, that we remove during the drying process, the less sample we have left over to do our analysis on. We would need to start with a larger amount if a lot of that is actually water content. Okay, so if the if it's a moist product, they need to send a bigger sample. If it's dry, if it's a dry product, not as much. That's right. Yep. Okay, is there a guideline? on your website where they can see dry product generally this is the amount or should they just call and, and find out or so we do have some guidelines on our website and i think other labs probably do it as well for proper sampling we have a pet food landing site specifically and we mention material or count by treat as megan was mentioning for the dry kibble and treats versus letter sample so we do have a little bit of guidelines but if there's a question go ahead and call Great. And then I think you mentioned some kind of fo follow-up after the fact. Did you guys say that? I mentioned that. Um, okay. It circles back to what I said earlier. We do have other tests that we can offer other than the three main big tests that we do treats, treat testing on. Some people decide they want to add on like a standard mineral test and get a, a mineral analysis or various other options that we have listed on our website. That's something also when you're sending your samples in and you need to make sure you're sending in enough because you may want to add on a test. So we hold on to those treats that we've tried. So we have the opportunity to do that if the customer wants us to. Okay. How long do you hold on to the treats for this kind of follow-up? What's the general holding time? For dry, once it's dried, now not fresh because we usually dry everything else. So once it's dried and ground, we hold on it for at least a month. Okay. So. I'll just mention we were getting out these dog bones and I actually noticed that a couple of them had started to mold because yeah. they are a little bit higher moisture content. So in that case, we're going to go ahead and get rid of this, what Megan fresh, was referring to right. as fresh material, right. but we would have some better preserved through our drying process material that we could still work with. I see. So if they want some other kinds of tests, if they're thinking about it, maybe it's best to do it with the original test because they won't have a long shelf life to do that That's afterwards. Right. Okay. Right. Do you see things like extra tests, like the mineral test or you name it tests? I don't know what you have, but do you typically see those extra tests being requested for dog treats or is that mainly dog food or? It depends. Yeah, it really, you, it's, and it's unusual. You may see it requested for an ice cream and then the next time requested for an actual like a dog food mix but yeah it does depend it's not really a, like one size fits all it's... and i'll just mention to you we are a feed certified feed testing certified lab we actually test for farmers for agricultural animals as in addition to the pet treats so we see a wide variety of sample types that come through and a, a huge number of test requests. So all of them are all apart, uh, depending on what people want to know about their sample week right. the testing. That's great, that's great. Okay, how should bakers, dog treat bakers, or anyone who sends in a sample, but how should they package this appropriately so you can work with it? Sure, great question. So these are in their original packaging. 
inside of a shipping container. The plastic bags are fine for the most part for these dry and jerky type samples. And then those would have been in cardboard boxes, obviously. As far as the cupcakes and the cakes and the ice cream, how would you say those come in? We like for them to be very sealed properly so that there's just really not, you don't want sample to escape from its packaging and mix with another sample that could be shipped at the same time. So these softer treats, that's the issue that we run into more often. And with the ice cream, it's just a nice tight container, something sealed tightly. We've even suggested cold packs for some of the ice creams and things that don't have a long shelf life so that you can preserve it to the point that if it takes several days, it's less likely to grow any kind of mildew or moisture or cold. So now might be a good time to mention, we would actually develop some online kits that we're going to start selling for sampling. So yeah, we we just put them online and they've got a box inside. So it's a prepaid, prepaid mailing box to us. So this is the ideal size. You can make me that yep. box over there that's already assembled. Already. So this is a four by four box. One of these should fit in there. Put your paperwork inside and ship it to us. That's the ideal amount. If you fill this box up, we're probably good. <laughs> yes. Okay. That is a great guideline. And it doesn't matter if they have a large bone. They could just break the bone to fit it in, oh, right? Sure. Okay. Yes. You're, you're going to do much work. worse. You're going to do much worse to it later. <laughs> but that's true. Yeah. The one thing I will say, these kits are not designed for the cold pack or the frozen material. So this would be for your dried stuff, your kibble, your jerky, that sort of thing. But it's going to be, the paperwork is simpler than our other form that we have. So the kit's designed to really help out these clients in a simplified way. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Nice. And we're hearing about it first. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. We one together just to show you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So for, let's say somebody has a pup cake, right? It's a cupcake, but for a dog, because we love to use those cute little dog terms. Could they just put a pup cake that has icing, right? We like to use dog friendly icings and frostings. Could they put a pup cake in a sealed plastic bag and put it in the box? Would that work? That would work. definitely work. Yes. Okay. Oh, but they're probably going to want the cold pack to keep it fresh because of the more moisture equals more chances for mold, right? It's true. That is very true. Yes. Uh, we have, we designed this box size to be able to hold a pup cake. Because yeah. we do it so often. Very often. But yeah, if there is the concern about um, if the cake is the high moisture content, that might not be the best option. We might need to use that cold pack. Okay, cool. Think, um, maybe the consideration of like how close you are to South, if you're in South Carolina versus if you're shipping from Texas, um, maybe that's where you need to start thinking, oh, this has a lot further to go and a lot more chance of interference in the long postal line. Yeah. Um, maybe if you're in North Carolina, shipping in South Carolina, it won't take quite as long. So it's just something to think about. Yeah. Um, or wherever your lab is. Wherever you're, of course, yes. we you know, prefer our lab, but <laughs> Your distance away from the lab of your lab of choice should be considered for sure. Yeah, you make a really good point. And then also, is there a weekend involved? Just the quicker it gets to you, right? The yeah. the better. Okay, that makes sense. You and even have control over the postal system, and that's, yeah. that's the hard part as far as customers and explaining why it takes so long or why we haven't received their sample yet. And there's a lot that can happen between. Tennessee and South Carolina. So it's just it's shipping things to consider whenever you are packaging those treats. Yep. When you receive the treats, what is the average turnaround time? So we shoot for about a, a business week. So five days-ish, but it depends on what we have in the queue, which could be literally hundreds of other samples <laughs> yeah. or it could be it's you. Yeah. But we, okay. we start to try for a week. And I think you mentioned raw meat hesitantly. Are there samples that you just don't accept? And would I guess raw meat would be one of them. Yeah, we have really tried to get the message out that raw meat is not something we really have the safety handling capacity for. 
So here at the lab, we do have some different sections for hazardous, potential hazardous materials. I will say potential because of course we, you want to assume that you're providing a, a safe product to your animal or someone's animal. But we don't know in transit what's happened to that raw meat. And so for the safety of the lab staff, we're just not gonna work on the raw meat samples. The other thing I did mention was bone samples. And we have worked with some things that have bone content, but the finer bones, the large bones, we don't actually have the ability to powder it, which right. is what we do to samples. We grind it to a powder. We don't have that capacity, so we can't take larger okay. bone samples. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good to know. What if a package does get delayed, as you were talking about, and it does show up moldy or, or spoiled? What do you do with that? How do you so go Mike forward? probably going to be the first one who sees it like right. that. So what are you going to do with that? <laughs> um, I would normally take it to my supervisor and uh, <laughs> discuss the situation. We don't, we would not normally like to test something that has been spoiled or, mold, or moldy, but that's, that's when we reach out to the customer and explain what's happened, explain that it's not in the form you would like to feed it to an animal and hope that they would be willing to send more sample, fresh sample. Yep. That makes sense. As dog treat bakers, especially when we are out and about doing our markets, we have dog people come in, but we'll have, Hey, I'm a cat person. And do you sell cat treats? And sometimes a baker might say, okay, yeah, let me develop a cat treat. So that does come up in our group too. Do you just test dog treats? What about cat treats or other pet treats? <laughs> so the, the, I'm laughing because I just gave a presentation last week and covered this huge list of animals. <laughs> So we are certified for testing many different types of animal feed. In fact, cat food was one of the recent samples that we had to provide for our proficiency program. So yes. we had to do the analysis on some cat food, llama, sheep, all, all kinds. So yes, we do accept yeah. cat treats. That's the simple answer to that. And then <laughs> even exotic, we've gotten things from exotic animals that we do have the capacity to test. Yes. You do it all over there. I have some questions that my dog treat baker Facebook group and some people on Instagram have submitted that they would like okay. to know the answers to you guys are ready. And then I also have some questions of my own as well. <laughs> do you submit an individual's guaranteed analysis results to AAFCO or anywhere? So we do not. We re provide the report to the client who has sent their sample to us. We do not submit for clients to regulating agencies. Good to know. How many samples, well, what, what is your volume every month, would you say? Like how many samples are you processing a month, do you think? And then how many of those would you say are dog treats? I think Megan can answer. Yeah, this is certainly, we're processing for feed samples, probably a little over a hundred. And I would say half are dog treats or okay. treats of some sort. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So about half are dog treats. That's interesting. That's so cool. If someone lost their guaranteed analysis results for any reason, how can they obtain them again? So we can resend your report and other labs like us should certainly also be able to do that. We also, when we email the report, there's a link to that. And if, if they lost the actual report, they can just go back to that link and click on it again. If they can find the email. Yeah. So get in touch if, if that doesn't work, but we can help you out with that. Awesome. Do you test for shelf life? That is another topic that comes up in the group. We do not here at this lab. So shelf life is dependent on, we talked about moisture constant pH in the sample. There's some other things affecting shelf life, but no, we do not do that testing here at this lab. Okay. Thank you. Bella wants to know, and it may be this, maybe some of these questions will be something that you guys do there or no, you, you don't do it at all. Just let me know. But Bella wants to know what are the best guaranteed analysis margins for cookies and cupcakes? Is that something you guys know? So that sounds like a nutritional question, and we would need an animal nutritionist to speak to that. So we are the chemists who do the measurements, right. and a nutritionist will need to answer what's good nutrition or not for the animal. 
Okay. That makes sense. Margie says, I submitted my treat and I got my results. My next batch of treats I felt did not come out as great as the first batch. If I just added a little bit of water to help the dough roll better, is there some leeway to where I can still use the results I was given or should I submit a whole new batch of treats for a new guaranteed analysis? So in general, if you've added a different ingredient and water is an ingredient, then we would recommend that you do another test. Um, water specifically, that moisture content that we keep going back to is so important and you will have changed your moisture content, which is gonna change your overall sample nutritional content. So we definitely recommend a retest. Okay, I understand. I guess she's saying there was a little bit of water in the dough to begin with. She added a little bit more, but even though it's the same ingredient, just the addition of putting more moisture in the treat will change that aspect of the guaranteed analysis, right? It would, that's right. Okay. It's gonna come out differently, yes. <laughs> okay, and the other question that we get a lot is what if I substitute a different color in the treat. And this is coming from two angles. Some people take a more natural approach and they derive, their colors are derived from natural fruit and veggie powders. Beetroot would make red, maybe spirulina would be green, and they would add those powders to the icing, whatever, to, to mix it. Other people um, like to use uh, food safe colors, uh, probably have no nutrition at all, um, in their dye. Is changing the colors in either camp going to affect the, the guaranteed analysis, do you think? So if it's a non-nutritive dye, meaning it's not going to affect your fat, fiber, protein, ash content, <laughs> then it wouldn't really matter as long as you're using the same volume. So you're not affecting the overall product by adding a different amount of the color. That should okay. be an issue between them. But if it, it is something um, that's going to add a little protein content to it, you're going to need to test separately. Okay. So some of those vegetable dyes could potentially uh, introduce some. I see a lot of changes. A lot of messy feet used so often recently because it's Valentine's Day. Treats coming in with beet powder or beet juice, I'm sure that would certainly cause a different mm -hmm. negative result. Is that something that maybe, I, I, I don't know if you would know the answer to this, but if I'm a dog treat baker and I look on the package of my beetroot powder and it has no protein, but now, now even though it might not have protein, it might have fiber and adding it might still change the GA. I see. Yeah, okay. certainly look at that label. It's they, they should have done the same yeah. thing you're, with your product. Right. And yeah. What's in there. Exactly. Yep. And if you're just listening, a GA is short for guaranteed analysis. It's just a shorter to say. Donna asks, is there a method to figure out calorie count from the analysis I already have? So she got the guaranteed analysis. Is there some way that you know of that she could just figure out the, the calorie content there? Sure. So on our reports, we actually give you a kilocalorie per pound in the results. So it's a calculated Great. value based on that content. And I'm sure other labs as well provide something that can be converted to calories per ounce, per treat, whatever it is. I've helped out. I actually have typed out some calculations that I'll send if someone asks that question. But our reports do actually have the calorie count on there. Cool. That's good news. Elizabeth asks, can you determine or guess shelf lives based on guaranteed analysis? We can actually estimate, but we don't provide this as a, as a value, but we could certainly say, and you could do this in your own fridge with your own food, but the higher moisture content of a material is more likely to grow mold more quickly. The higher moisture, that moisture is allowing microbes to grow, essentially. So higher moisture content, shorter shelf life. But we don't do a hard, fast rule about what that shelf life actually is. Fair enough. Marissa asks, do we submit all kinds of treats, example, baked and dehydrated, like meats or veggies, which we talked about, no raw meat, um, but you guys can process baked or dehydrated. Um, and then if we added icing to decorate a cookie treat, does that change it if they add icing to a treat? Would they need a new guaranteed analysis? <laughs> yes, we're both nodding. Yeah. Yes. 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 Icing certainly going to add to the, 
the content. So right. we'll need to be tested. Yep. Tiffany asks, I would like to know about the brackets that the numbers are in, in the test. So there's the numbers in the brackets and what is that? Is, are they, how do you know if the numbers are good or bad in the brackets? I'm not quite sure what she means. Do you? The results would be your numbers. And I think yeah. uh, our reports here from the lab don't necessarily have brackets saying what's optimal nutrition. So we don't provide that. Again, this is one of the earlier questions. We would need a yeah. minimal nutritionist to really speak to that. Okay, almost done. Courtney wants to know two things. And you already covered this. How does someone submit treats that are not dry consistencies, like frozen treats, gummies, gravies? And you had mentioned certainly the ice packs to keep cold, the frozen, things like that. But what about gummies and gravies? Is that just a more cold packs, you think, for those? Yeah, I would think so. Have we received a gummy before? Yeah. Um, we've had gummy like material, but actual formed gummies or gummy bears. I don't recall uh, receiving that. Certainly gravies. We've definitely received gravies. Yeah. And again, yes, the cold pack, a nice sealed container. I would not suggest ever sending glass through the postal system. <laughs> that That's just not a good idea. Yeah. Do something like that. Nice, non-breakable, sealable container. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And then can I submit CBD dog treats to the lab? I make my own CBD oil and I don't know the full process. So if you received a treat that had CBD, would you still process it? And then maybe do you provide any feedback for the CBD portion? Okay. So yeah, I guess that's two separate questions. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can analyze the sample that has CBD in it. That's fine. And it's legal to grow hemp here in South Carolina. So we can handle things with CBD. We don't do an actual measurement of CBD content, though. We don't have that ability. Okay, for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Those are all the questions that everyone asked. Do you have any anything that you want to share with our viewers? Anything that you want them to know? We've already shared quite a bit. I will just mention we are here at Clemson in South Carolina. So we have in-state fees for our South Carolinians who are pet food bakers. We do have some out-of-state fees that are different for our out-of-state pet food bakers. So just keep that in mind if you're shipping here to, to South Carolina to Clemson. Okay, for sure. And I'll make sure that I include all your links in the description of the podcast and in the YouTube description as okay. well. And it'll be to your, yeah, your website here. Is there a form on your website that they would fill out the form? Do they print the form and mail the form with the sample and then payment? How do they submit payment? That's, yeah, those are great questions. Thank you for asking. Another reminder. Yes, we do have a form online um, on our website for them to fill out. And then we certainly want a printed copy in the box, whatever size the box is with the sample so that we can be sure that we have all the right information associated with the sample. The payment, we accept check, so a check could be included. You can also pay online, which I can send you a link for that as well. But we Yes, we have online payment as an option. And then like we mentioned, the kits So we're gonna have, those are, you order those online and that covers the payment for the analysis and the shipping of the box to get to us as well. So how convenient for that. Yep. Yeah. Gosh, it has been tremendous having you both on the show. Thank you so much. I cannot wait for viewers to see this and know what you know about guaranteed analysis, although we won't be, we won't have all the credentials behind us, but we'll know what we need to know as dog treat right. makers. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having us.